So today we're going to be covering James chapter 1, which is a good thing because we covered James chapter 1 last week. We're going to be covering James chapter 1, verses 19 through 27, talking about being a hearer of the word, not just a doer. Uh, we're so thankful that you have an opportunity to be with us today. Let's have a word of prayer before we get started. Lord, I thank you so much for the opportunity that we have that you give us, that we can look into your word and we can understand. Lord, I realize it's not just important for us to read it and to understand it, but then, Lord, to do it. We thank you for this lesson today. We pray, Lord, right now that you take the weak stumblings of your servant here as I prepared uh, throughout the week, Lord, to, to be able to provide this information you've given me. Help me, Lord, even now to give to those who might listen the very words that you need for them to hear, that they might be able to become the doers and not just the hearers of the word. We thank you, Lord, for all you do for us, for your many mighty blessings, your comfort in times of trials. We thank you, Lord, for all you do for us, for it's in your name we do pray it. Amen. Okay, so today, uh, as we said, we're continuing to talk about the book of James, just a little bit of introduction. Remember, the book of James was written to the church. Uh, in the first part of the chapter, we learn that we um, we can all count on trials. I mean, that's just a statement of fact. We can all count on trials coming our way. It's how we handle those trials is what matters. So, um, you know, we... we um, we should use those trials to strengthen our patience because the little trials will help you endure the larger ones. And we know, again, we said you live, I mean, you're born, you live, and you die. No matter what everyone does, um, it's a, a statement of fact. And along the way, there's troubles and trials along the way. Well, we're going to be covering verses uh 19 through 27, but I felt amiss not to cover the information in, contained in verses 12 through 18. There are some of the most valuable scriptures in this passage that I just could not skip over. So if you would turn into your Bibles in James chapter 1, unless we go look at, we're going to look at those that's not covered in our lesson today, but in verses 12 through 18, because I think it leads into the other verses. So we're going to use that as an introduction. So if we look at verse 12, James chapter 1, verse 12 says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. And remember, temptation can be trials. For when he is tried, he, is, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. So in verse 12, we see that God promises us that we endure trials in our life. We will be blessed with the strength to endure to the end and to receive a crown of life. See, God promises us that. Verses 13 through 16. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. God wants to tell us something about this passage of Scripture. This is very important. Do not be deceived by Satan concerning sinful temptations. See, one thing, God never tempts anyone to sin. Why? Because God he said God cannot be tempted by evil, neither he going to tempt anyone with evil. I mean, evil and God are not synonymous. Man can only blame himself for his temptation. He's drawn away, it says, of his own lust and enticed. And then it said, this sin that he has, this is a sin he has a personal desire to do. It's his own lust. What's lust for you may not be lust for me. You know, you may desire something that I don't desire. So we're drawn away of our own lust and enticed. Each person is different. The result, though, of undetended lust is desire is sin. As we lust, to the, the, if we if we allow lust to overcome us, it comes into sin, and then the, the Bible says that the result of sin is death, being eternal separation from God, 
And he finally says, don't let anyone else convince you otherwise. We sin not because God made us do it. There used to be an old comedian that said, the devil made me do it. The devil didn't make you do it. God didn't make you do it. You did it because you wanted to. See, Eve ate the fruit in the garden because she says she looked upon it and desired it. She lusted after it. Sin is always a result of lust. You know, so many people get married today and divorced today. A lot of it has to do with they're not in love, they're in lust. You know, children that get, they, they feel, I love him, I love him. They were more infatuation than love. Love is something that grows over time. Those of us that have been married for a period of time, we know love is something that grows. Well, in the case of lust, you see something you want, it, and it's about yourself. It's not about them. Lust, by the way, is about something you want. It's not about what you can do for somebody else. It's what they can do for you. So it says, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So let's first look at verse 17. Verse 17 said, Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. See, everything God, everything God gives us meets this characteristic. What is those? Every good and every perfect gift is from God. If it's good and it's perfect, it's from God. If it's not good and it's not perfect, it's not from God. See, these are perfect. The, the gifts are perfect because he is perfect. Uh, he's always the same, never changing. So therefore, we can trust him. When God gives us something, he gives us something good for us. So let's look at verse 18, which is the ending of our introduction. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruit of his creatures. He saved us because he himself wanted us to be saved. He saved us because he loved us, because he wanted to do for us, not because we wanted him to do for us, but because he wanted to do for us. He gave us his word so we could be saved. That's what this is all important. This is what this lesson is about. That's why it's so important to cover these verses, because it's about the word of God. He gave us his word so that we could be saved. I, there's an old uh, song that is sung by um, um, Willie, uh, Ricky Skaggs, and it says, if you don't believe the Bible, then you don't know the Lord. And uh, when I was going to Carolina Bible Institute many, many decades ago, and Dr. Floyd Terry was in charge, uh, doctor, I went to, I used to get there early and ask him questions and, you know, try to find out things and try to glean from him. And um, I asked him one time, I said, um, what do you think about that song? If you don't know the Bible, then you don't know the Lord. You don't believe the Bible, you don't know the Lord. He said, it is absolutely truth, for you cannot be saved. Listen to me. You cannot be saved if you do not believe the word of God. It is impossible. The word of God is his word. If you don't believe in his word, you don't believe in him. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. If you don't believe in the word, you can't be saved. Impossible. Be mad, be fussing, be whatever you want to be, but it doesn't change the fact of the word. And the word is, if you don't believe the word. So we come to this very important passage now in to our lesson. See, the word, in the word, he laid down his foundational truths. So James now turns to our response to God's plan and purpose for us as the church and his body. So this is what we're looking at now. So we turn to verse 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. The word wherefore. You know, this word simply links the last section, which is talking about uh, the, uh, the drawn away of the lust and enticed and all those things. He kind of ties that in. It can be translated, you know this. Wherefore. You know this, he says. Uh, I told you those things so I could say to you these things. Wherefore? See, this is the response I expect based upon the truth I provided you. He said, so since I told you those things, 
This is the response I expect from you. See, God tells us things and expects a response. He says, wherefore, my beloved. Again, James here is writing to the church. They were his church members because he's writing to his church. So they, hey, this is a personal plea to his friends. Personal plea to those people that he knew. Now, these were brethren. These were church folks that he labored with. That's, that's interesting. James is a very interesting book because it's written to the church specifically. And so some of the things he writes in there to the church, he writes not just to the Christians in the church, but to the lost in the church. Because as we know, not everyone today who will sit under the gospel, even at Branch Chapel where I'll be going, will be saved today. There won't be. There'll be people there who are lost. Unfortunately, some that don't know they're lost. They're deceived. But there'll be people there that know they're lost. So the thing is, James preached. He taught in his by in this book. He talked to those who were church members and those that were right and those that were wrong. But he said, my beloved brother, let every man be swift to hear. Swift to hear what? He means eager to hear God's word. You, you should be swift to hear. You should want it. You should desire. You should grasp every opportunity to learn about God's word. Yeah, the Greek meaning here is to be quick to the hearing. Let every man be quick to the hearing. Want to hear it. It's as though hearing the word that it is through the hearing of the word that we can protect ourselves from the lust then of the previous verses, right? When lust hath conceived, every man is drawn away of his own lust and enticed, and the lust conceives that bring us sin and similar things bring for death. How do you prevent that from happening? Stop lusting. Allow the Holy Spirit to work through you by reading God's word. Fill your life with his word. That's what he said. Let every man be swift to hear, eager to hear the word of God. This is slow to speak and slow to laugh. Sometimes I hear people misuse this passage of scripture. This is not talking about slow to speak and slow to wrath. It's not talking about how you deal with other people. That's not what he's talking about. I've always heard people say, well, the Bible says you need to be slow to speak, slow to wrath. That's how you work with people. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the word of God. Let every man be swift to hear the word of God. And then he said, be slow to speak the word of God, right? And then be slow to be angry about what the Word of God says to you. <laughs> That's what he's saying. Let every man be quick to hear the Word, slow to go out and preach the Word, and then slow to be angry because of what we hear of the Word. Um, what you say about the Word needs to be sure, right? Slow to speak. You need to make sure you need to study. Let me tell you, it takes me a while to study this lesson. I can't just jump in it. I've had a lot going on this week. Some of you know me personally. You know I've had a lot going on this week. A lot of things that's, uh, that has hindered me and has put thoughts on my mind or whatever. And the, 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 the point is, sometimes if we're not careful, we don't spend the time that we need to. But I, I could not stand before you or sit before you today without having gone through the Word and read and studied and made myself prepared uh, he said, "Need be slow to speak. Some truths are simply some, you know, some truths of the word are simple. I am the way. No man comes to follow by me. That's a simple truth. You don't need a lot of study for that, folks. Jesus said, "I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life." We studied that before a few weeks ago. The truth that those are easy truths. Other biblical truths require more study. 2 Timothy 2 5 says, 2 15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. See, study to show yourself approved unto God. Because remember, you're not trying to please people. I'm not here today trying to please you. You know, if you get what you get, okay, I'm here pleasing God. God is telling me to say something that He knows you're listening to today. And don't you think I think that's an awesome responsibility on my part to share the gospel with you, to share the word of God with you, that I'm speaking the very words that God himself would have me speak. That's an awesome responsibility. All the preachers that stand in the pulpit today and preach the word, they're going to hear the truth. They have to proclaim the truth, the very words of God. They are held accountable for that. 
Luke 12, 24, uh, 12, 48b says, For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. See, God requires more of us as we share the word. The teachers in the Sunday school classes and the preachers, those people that are standing before people and sharing the gospel with them, they're held to a higher standard. Much is required of them. Preaching and teaching the word requires us all to study, to prepare before we speak, to ensure that the truth of his word is what we share and not our opinions. Because, see, our opinion of the word doesn't matter. It says, slow to wrath. The word of wrath can be translated as anger. Slow to be angry. The Greek word ori, which comes, which means a deep-seated resentment. Slow to have a deep-seated resentment. Is that what? James is saying, be eager to hear the word of God. Reluctant to be in a position to speak it because we understand the awesome responsibility. Then this says, be very slow to let it boil inside you with resentment when you hear it. The word of God breaks you because we're sinful people. We have lust in our beings. We're, we have a sinful nature. And therefore, it wants to rebel when we hear the word of God. It's by nature. Our nature is not that of his. And therefore, there's a conflict. There's a battle within us. You know, I have my website. It's the battle was within. Because the truth is, the war that we face as Christians, we face individually. We must each fight that battle within us. And that's what he says. Don't let the word of God make you angry, but allow it to, to work inside of you. Be slow to speak and slow to wrath for the word of God. Paul says in Galatians 4.16, I am therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth. See, Paul recognized that when he preached the truth of the word, people became offended. See, the bad thing is sometimes Christians become offended by the word of God because it's contrary to their thoughts. If you're a Christian today, I'm going to offend some of you. I'm not offending you. The Word of God is. The Word of God is offending you. If you're out there today and you proclaim to be a Christian and you don't believe God's Word is infallible, inerrant Word of God, then you got a problem. And God needs to convict you of that sin. And He, as one of our former pastors said, He needs to burn your barley field if that's what it takes. See, you need to be right with God. If you are supporting people as we go through this election cycle, and I'm not trying to be political, I'm trying, I'm trying to be rightly proclaiming the word of God, you be careful who you support. If you're in favor and you're voting for people who are supporting abortion, that's killing unborn babies. If you're a Christian today and you're okay with killing unborn babies, you got a problem. That's innocent life. you got a problem. And God's telling you today, you got a problem. If you support alternate lifestyles, that's anti, it's against what the Word of God says, you got a problem. You can be mad with me all you want to. It's God's Word. Be slow to anger, because God's Word is truth. Okay? Not digress on that. Let me move along. Verse 20 says, For the wrath of, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. James tells us how we should receive the Word. James tells us why hearing the word would make us angry. See, being angry about the truth comes from God's word cannot make one righteous. Being angry about the truth that comes from God's word cannot make you righteous. If you're mad about God's word and what the preacher preaches, what I just told you, that makes you angry. That's not coming from righteousness. That's coming from the lust that's inside of you, the evil. That still remains. You understand? The human, the, 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 the carnal man that doesn't want to hear the truth, that makes them mad. Remember, we know that, uh, uh, when Stephen were pre was preaching after Jesus' resurrection, Stephen was preaching it and he proclaimed the truth of the word. It said they stopped their ears and ran to him. They couldn't stand to hear the word anymore because the word of God was piercing their hearts and they could not stand it. If you're fighting God's conviction in your life, you will not receive the righteousness of God. God must break us before he remakes us. 
Hosea 6 1 says, Come, let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, for he will heal us. He has smitten, and he will bind us up. God has to break your hearts. He has to break your will. He has to crush your spirit because that's evil. He has to fill you. You have to allow him to break you, to make you. Um, I heard uh, uh, there was a book written many years ago on business aspect. It was entitled, If It Ain't Broke, Break It. See, there's only so much you can do until you break it and start again. God needs to break us, folks. We must receive the word with submission. That's what he says in verse 20. Verse 21, first part says, Therefore, again, therefore, lay apart all filthiness and supremacy of naughtiness. Before the Lord can work the righteousness of God, sin must be dealt with. Before you can understand the word of God, you've got to deal with sin. You can't, God will not, Reveal himself to you if you're living in sin. All he can do is convict you of that sin. He says, therefore lay apart. This laying apart is talking about, it's the, it's, it's the same thing as like putting, taking off your clothes. At the end of the day, my clothes, I got I cut the grass yesterday. Yesterday, I'm running behind. I, had, I said things came up, so I had to cut the grass yesterday in the heat. And um, I got done, I was drenched. My clothes were sweaty, smelly. I had to take those things off. I had to take off these dirty clothes that were on me. This is what he says here. Therefore, lay apart. Take off these things that's hindering you. The Greek word filthiness is repuria. It's a word used for dirty clothes. He said it's a, it, it, it's a word used for filth, scum that gets on the body when you're out in dirt and you're working. As we go through this world, we're, we're bombarded. Watch TV. Right is wrong, and wrong is right. Uh, there's a commercial that comes on now from Old Navy that just really infuriates me because they bought into all this anti-biblical stuff, really. And I'm thinking, why? You're just trying to sell jeans. Why don't you just sell jeans? But no, this filthiness of the world has attached itself. Uh, and it says, therefore, lay aside filthiness. This is the scum. The root word rupo, it refers to wax in your ears. It's the same thing as get rid of the dirt that accumulates and unplug your ears so you can hear the word. The world will hinder you from hearing the truth, James says. Don't let that happen. Put aside these dirty things, these things that hinder you. Let me tell you, if your spirit, I've watched some things, and I said, I just can't watch those things. It's hurting my spirit. I just can't do it. I just can't, I can't do it. It hurts my spirit. Uh, God has told me not to do it, so I can't. You understand? Get rid of the dirt that accumulates and plugs your ears so you can't hear the word of God. Um, the, the last one, the preventity of naughtiness, the abundance of wickedness. The abundance. The world we live in is full of wickedness. It is loaded. You're talking like a loaded potato. We're going to have a spud bar at our church in a couple of weeks, and we always like to fix it up with everything. We load it, a loaded potato. We put everything on it, you know, and we have a meal. So I can make a meal potato. You can. If you've not ever done it, you can have a meal out of a spud bar. Let me tell you, let me tell you we, do it, we do it at our church several times a year, and you can make a meal out of a potato. The point is, we load it up. Well, the world is loaded with sin. It's, it's a full buffet, folks. The abundance of sin. Man's sin hinders the work of the word of God. You understand? Peter, Peter tells us we're saved by the word. 1 Peter 1.23 says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible by the word of God. See, if we can stop you, if Satan can stop you from hearing the word of God and letting it get into your heart and mind, you cannot be saved. You cannot be saved today without the word of God. If you don't believe the Bible, you can't be saved. It's simple enough. Peter says, Peter tells us through reading the word, we can lay aside all of our sins. First Peter 2, 1 says, wherefore laying aside all malice, all guilt, 
all hypocrisies and envy and all evil speaking as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. See, if Satan can convince you not to worry about the word of God, the word of God is what saves you. The reading the word of God, understanding it, for in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. See, reading the word of God is what it matters. We must grow thereby. But before you're going to be able to take the word and grow by it, you're going to have to deal with sin because sin is a barrier that's blocking off what you can hear, blocking away the things that, 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 that allows you to hear and understand the word of God. Second part of the verse says, And receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. This is important. So the first part of it, remember, he says, uh, 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 lay aside the filthiness and the naughtiness. Why? And receive with meekness the engrafted word. Receive. Interesting, this word, receive, applies to a grounding seed. Mark 4.20 says, And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it, and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. Receive. It's like throw and see that. Acts 17, 11 said, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word of readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. See, this word receive is actually a command. When a person is saved, they receive the engrafted word of God in their soul. It is automatic. This is the ability to read and understand the word through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. For I had a guy, a friend of mine, who was a, an he was a, an atheist, agnostic as best. When I worked at Data General thirty some years ago, and the man was he was I mean he was tough to deal with because he read the Bible. But somebody convinced him to go, and, and he went up to uh, Fellowship Baptist Church in Clayton and got saved in a revival. He went to hear it so he could counteract what they were saying the next day. And while he was there, the Holy Spirit got on him, and he got saved. The man went on and became a preacher, and he preaches. Uh, I don't know where he's at today, but I assure you, he's a, he was a man of God. Let me tell you. He can read the Bible. He said, now I read the Word, and I understand it so much better. I could not understand the Word. All the reading I did, I could not understand it until the Holy Spirit reveals it to me. See, the ability of the Holy Spirit, he says, receive with meekness. The word will break us and lead us to the correction from sinful man to newborn babes in Christ. This will lead to a battle in each of us, right? We must meet that battle between our flesh and our new direction in our life, including correction with meekness. As God reveals to us things that we need to change through reading his word, we need to accept it. Don't become puffed up, you know, and we need to take it with meekness. Yes, Lord, I understand. Yes, Lord, I know what you're saying. Please forgive me. Help my unbelief. Lord, I pray, even right now, I pray, Lord, help me my unbelief. Help me, Lord, to be what I need to be. Help me do the things that I need to do. I pray for those that are listening the same way. In meekness. Let us submit ourselves. 1 Peter 2.2 2 says, As newborn babe, desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. Your flesh does not want to listen to the word of God because you're proud. You don't need someone or something to tell you what to do. You can figure it out on your own. James is telling us we need to be teachable, really wanting to know the material. We should go to, do you go to church and say, well, I'll go, I don't want to go. Or do you go saying, what is the word going to have for me today? I'm excited this morning. I don't know exactly what my pastor is going to have for me for today, but I'm looking forward to it. I'm expecting God to speak to me through my pastor today. Something that I am in need of hearing. Something that I will change my life because of the preaching and teaching of the word today. I'm looking forward to that. See, I do it with some, then he says the engrafted word. We're to receive the engrafted word. Engrafted means to become grafted. Well, so what's grafted? Grafted is to insert a graft into a tree or other plant. 
you know, you put it in, you engraft it. It's to cause a plant to reproduce through grafting. So you take a, a little uh, piece of a plant or a tree and you put it in the joint of the other one. You cut it open, you put it, and you graft it. I'm not good at it. I'm not, I'm not a horticulturist or something like that. But it's done often. You can engraft and You can actually have this tree and that tree growing together on the same tree. See, the word here can be seen as seed. When it is implanted in the soul, it germinates and springs forth eternal life. When we're saved, the Holy Spirit puts his word in our heart so that then it can grow. See, only seed that fails to fall on properly prepared soil and then cared for will fail. All the seeds that fall in the proper soul, all the seeds, if we're prepared for it, if we read God's word, if we study, if we allow God's Holy Spirit to crush and convince us, our seed will grow. It will continue to grow. You know, the parable of the sower is in Mark chapter 4. We're not going to take the time to read it. But the, the, the parable of the sower, that taught me, went out and sowed the seed. Some fell here, some fell there. Some fell in good ground and grew 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 80 times. But he says, not only is the word, not only is the word, he says, receive the meekness and graft in the word, which is able to save our souls. He says, this is not a choice for Christians. <laughs> Receiving the word, uh, the engrafted word is not a choice for Christians. It's an instantaneous condition of your soul, right? Which is able to say, you can't be saved unless the Holy Spirit engrafts the word in your heart. That's what makes you able to understand and comprehend God's word. Saves your soul. This is the grafting, right? This budding forth a vine that is now eternal. This grafting creates a strong incentive to correct your dullness in your hearing. Your true self, your body, the soul is saved, includes body and soul. John, 1 John 5, 13 says, These things I have written unto you, that you believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. These things have I written. See, through the Word of God, we know those things. We know who God is. We know how to become saved. And we know how we can trust in Him. Verses 22. But be ye doers of the Word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. There's two kinds of hearing of the Word. Hearing that understands and leads to obedience. Hearing that goes in one ear and out the other, right? You either hear it and obey it, or you hear it and it goes out. The engrafted word, that'll make a change in our life of the believer. Resulting in the word saying and doing something about it. Not hearers only. The great word for here, for this here is auditor. Uh, you know, how many of you have ever audited a class in school? Well, you know, if you audit... This simply means you took the course to just hear the material. You didn't, you're not going to be charged with completing any of the task. But you also don't get any of the rewards. So we have people that come to church and Sunday school, people listening today, they'll hear the word. They'll audit the class. They'll audit the church services. That's all they are. They're auditors. They're not hearers. Hearers are people that do more than just hearing it. Right? You got to be a doer. It says deceiving your own selves. The word deceive can be seen as called delude. Uh, it's a mathematical term referred to miscalculations. Miscalculating for yourself, it says. It's deceiving as a result of false reasoning. You know, those that are just here, those that are auditing it are miscalculating. They're, they're, just, they're fooling themselves. See, not everyone who professes to be a Christian is actually a Christian. Matthew 7, 21 not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. See, going to church and repeating some prayer, it's not the same as having a change in your life. If you don't want to do God's work, don't have a burning desire to learn about his word, if I was you, I'd be concerned. Because did you get it? Let me tell you, today is the day of salvation. If you don't feel, if you don't feel the urge to be a doer of the word, if you don't feel an urge to listen and learn and want to learn more about God's word every day, you may not have time sometimes. The cares of this life sometimes hinders you. I understand that's not what I'm saying. I'm talking about those people who have a desire. If you don't have a desire to study and to learn about God, then 
there's something wrong. Maybe you ain't got what you got. Maybe you don't have it. Maybe you have it here and not here. Maybe you have a professing of the faith and not a possessing of the faith. You understand? Professors are not the same as possessors. Verse 23. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For if any, this is an application to anyone to follow. This is a roadmap for everyone. Be ye a hearer of the word and not a doer. James expands his focus here to say to, uh, to do it. The Jewish rabbis have a statement. A true disciple learns so that he may do, not so that he may merely know or teach. A true disciple, he says, learns that he may do, not so that he may merely know or teach. These are church folks. Come to church every week. They're there when the doors open. They hear the truth proclaimed week after week. They leave the service to live as they never heard it before, as if nothing changed. He's likened to a man that says, beholding his natural face in a glass. The example is one who gets up and sees what he looks like in the mirror, but makes no improvement. You know, there was actually very little mirrors in those days. You know, glass had not been developed until the 13th century. So they used, the wealthier people used gold or silver or brass, and they polished it so they could actually see their image. But their image was distorted. So what he says here is this natural face. This refers to the countenance at birth, what you really look like. The face that he was born with. Uh, this reflection was intended to be an accurate reflection, not one you would see through a distorted image. The analogy is that just as a man can see his natural face in the mirror, he can see his spiritual face in the pages of God's Word. You can see who you are in the Word of God. The Word of God will reveal to you your weaknesses, your needs, your wants, your desires. The Word of God is a mirror that you can see what you should be and then who you are. Verse 24, for he belongeth, he beholdeth himself and goeth, for he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner he is. We see in this example several things. He clearly sees what his issues are. He doesn't leave there not knowing. But he does nothing to correct his sin. This is true for the natural face as well as for the spiritual. Many people will come to church services today and the word of God will be proclaimed and their hearts will be pierced knowing that they need to make action and will leave there again disappointed because they won't take action. He said, behold, he looked at that himself and saw himself for what he was including all his faults. He saw it all for behold, he beholdeth himself. He goeth his way. After seeing his needs, he did nothing about it. Then he says, straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was, without even pausing to take action whatsoever, not stopping to think about who he was or who he represented. He simply ignored what he knew was right and needed fixing. If we do not do the work of him that sent us, we will forget the man we're supposed to be. You hear that? If we do not do the work of him that sent us, we will forget the man that we're supposed to be. Christianity is not about a building nor creed only, but a faith relationship with God through Jesus Christ that impacts us in every area of our life, every single day. Jesus Christ in your life changes you. You must live your life around Him and what He wants for you. Every facet of your life. Don't keep any compartment closed. You must break down all those things. See, James' desire here, a reaction, he, 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 it's an intended look, an in-depth and continuous study of God's Word. This study would allow a person to see flaws and change his or her life in line with God's standards. That's what the Word is supposed to do. This kind of mirror that God provides is unique. See, it shows us our inner nature in the same way that a regular mirror shows us our exterior features. Both mirrors reflect what there is. When God's word points out something to us that needs fixing, it's our duty to fix it. Verse 25, For whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetter hearer, forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. He said, looketh into 
literally stooping down to take a closer look. He's not just casual, but if you want to really dig into who you are, you got to dig into the word. If you stoop down, but whosoever looketh, dig down into the perfect law of liberty. This is freeing for Christians. It's not a restricting law. Hebrew 12, 1 says, Therefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. See, Paul says, we see these things, and let's lay them aside. James said, stoop down, look in, get a closer look. You know, suddenly you bring things closer to your face so you can really see it. He said, and continue therein. It's contrasted with verse 24 that said, goeth his way. But this time he says, who continually therein, looking. He being not a forgetful hearer. He didn't just hear it and walk away. He didn't sit in a church service as an auditor, but now he takes it with him into the field. He got his new weapons. He got his battle array. He got his sword. He got his word. He's got this. He buried this in his heart so that he might not sin against God. And he takes it with him into the field with battle, ready to swing his sword, ready to proclaim his truth. This is a person that's not only a hearer of the God's word, but takes action as a result. This man shall be blessed in his deed. This is the very doing that is blessing. Psalms 19.11 says, Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is a great reward. God promises us a great reward. Verse 26. If any man among you seems to be religious. Oh, isn't that terrible? Do you want to be seen to be religious? If any among you seems to be religious and brighteth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. If you think you're following your belief, you seem to be religious, James says. I'm going to give you three tests. After we talked about this, I'm going to give you three tests where you can evaluate yourself. Test number one, your conversation. Bridleth not his tongue. Listen to what you say. Listen to your conversations. Listen to your words. Listen to your jokes. Listen to your story retorts. Listen to your conversation. What comes out of your mouth? Lofty things? Godly things? Things that exalt, lift up, honor Christ? Is your speech seasoned with grace? Because when you're an obedient believer and you're not just taking the word in, but you're putting it back out, it shows up in your speech. Luke 46, 647 says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of the heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. Uh, someone asked uh, Mike Huckabee, who's a governor of, former governor of Arkansas, former presidential candidate, he, he's on the news a lot of times as a commentary, fine Christian man, Christian pastor or Baptist pastor, former pastor, pastor. He said this, they asked him a question about these people who were using this foul language to describe the President of the United States. I mean, vulgar language. And they asked him about it. He said, well, it's simple. If it ain't in you, it ain't going to come out of you. You hear that? That's what he said. If it ain't in you, it ain't going to come out of you. And that's what he says here. For the abundance of the heart, mouth speaketh. If you have a problem with language, if you have a problem with the things that you say and do, it's in you. You got to get it out of you. The word will help you get it out of you. That's what James says here. If you have a problem with speech, you got a problem. He gets to verse 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God the Father is this. To visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Test number two, your relationship with others. If you want to know whether a person is a doer, listen to what they say and watch how they deal with people in need. You'll, you'll see the love of Christ in doers. You'll see sacrifice. You'll see compassion. You'll see kind-heartedness. You'll see tenderness. You'll see mercy. You'll see grace. Our church yesterday had, uh, had a great event um, uh, that they did for the community. They were getting nothing back in return. It was giving get a chance. They did that. The church came together and they did that. And they did that because they loved the people in the community. They loved it not because they could get anything for it, but because they love Christ. And they gave that's an example of their relationship that James talks about here. Test number three, holy living. Are you living a holy life? Are you living a godly living? How are you living your life before God? See, I always say this. He sees you when you're naked. 
and they got nothing else. When you're all stripped down, you have nothing. All your warts, all your things, all your scars, everything. God sees you when you're naked. You got nothing in your way. There's nothing to hide from with God. See, God today, James today, provides us several things. He provides us the truth of his word. How powerful is his word? Are you today a hearer, an auditor of his word? Or are you a doer of his word? God wants you to be a doer. It will change your life if you let it. We thank you for your time. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for your word. Help me, Lord, to be a doer, not a hearer. Help me, Lord, not just to audit the class, but Lord, let me go and get the grades. Let me go bad or good. Let me find out what I need. Let me accept the, the, the conviction and meekness. Let me, Lord, be an example to others. Let me say the things I need to say. Let my speech be right. Let my caring for others be seen. Let me, Lord, be the type of person you want me to be as long as you want. Let me fight this battle that you give me through reading your word and unwavering. I thank you, Lord, for what you do for us in Jesus' name. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. I pray that God will work in your life today. Hey, don't be an auditor today. Be a doer of his word. Thank you for your time and your attention.